And one end, clowns are fun, right? They're funny, they do magic tricks, they sometimes make weird noises, they're great. But on the other end, we have clowns that are dark and scary and disturbing, right? It's not pushing it far to say that clowns are the modern versions of angels and demons, okay? Now the interesting thing is that this, this contradiction between light and dark is something we also have in web of thoughts, right? <laughs> on one end, it's not even looking at it. <laughs> on one end, web performance is a lot of fun, right? We get to use magic tricks to make things faster. Of course, sometimes it makes weird noises, but we have to look at that. But on the other end, web performance can also be very dark and scary and disturbing. <laughs> Right? This is when we try to optimize something, but it doesn't actually work. And that's usually due to some of the inherent technical complexity in our platform. Now, we do a lot of work to try to hide that complexity from developers. Right? We have a lot of abstractions, especially around things like the network and HTTP2 and 3. As a developer, you don't have to care about that. It's kind of abstracted away from the browser. It will do that for you. The only thing you need to use is these kind of high-level features on the sites that allow you to like nudge the black box a bit, right? You have things like preload, like fetch priority, async, and defer that you can use. Conceptually, that's great. But in practice, if you actually try to use these high-level features without knowing what the black box is doing, you can end up making mistakes that actually make things a lot slower instead of faster. We've had some great examples over the years. For example, the web page test team found a page that preloaded 381 resources and used none of them. <laughs> okay. Then we had recently the uh, WordPress team. When native image loading became a part of the platform, they pushed a patch that made all the images on all WordPress websites lazy loading by default, including <laughs> the largest content of all paint images. It's, of course, terrible for performance, right? So that's kind of what I've always been saying. If you don't really know what the black box is doing, you can end up misusing these higher-level features, which is why, the past few years, I've been trying to give people a bit more insight into what the black box is doing, okay? We're going to do that today, of course, as well, on one very specific subtopic of that, and that is how browsers actually request and load resources in an HTML page. Right? And that is because there is this weird, what I would like to call a two-step phase or a two-phase loading process going on on a ton of web pages, where you kind of have one batch of resources requested first, and then you have like a pause, like a gap, and then the rest is requested after that. Now some of you might say, Robin, I know what that is. That is HTTP 1, right? Because HTTP 1 has limited connections available if they're all in use you would have to wait until they become idle again to actually be able to request the next batch. Good guess, not actually what's happening because this also happens on HTTP 2 and 3. Now you might say, Robin, then I know what it is. These bottom resources are just not in the HTML, right? They're requested dynamically, loaded through JavaScript, or maybe a CSS background image. Could be, but also not the case here. Here, all these resources are just in the HTML. And still, the browser ends up delaying a good chunk of them, not requesting them immediately, even though it has discovered them right when the HTML came in. Right? So let's explore why this happens and what we can do with that. <laughs> the reason for that does come down to original HTTP 1.1. There, Indeed, if you have one H1 connection, the car, you can only load one resource on it at a time, the clouds. Right. If you would have just one connection, everything would be very slow. So browsers, in practice, open several parallel connections, typically six per domain. And if you're wondering what that one scary clown is doing there on the bottom with the five happy ones, that's the clown that's going to carry all our JavaScript. Okay, That's why it's there. So that's HTTP 1. Now, for HTTP 2 and 3, things, of course, are very, very different. In this analogy, you will have just one connection, one car, that can suddenly carry a ton of clowns, a ton of requests at the same time, right? This is what you sometimes see referred to as the H2 and H3 multiplexing feature, right? Where you can have a ton of requests in parallel on the same connection. However, a lot of people still misinterpret how this works. 
It's not because you as the browser can, for example, request 50 resources at the same time, that the server can also send back those 50 resources at the same time as well. You still have limited bandwidth available, right? So the server is still going to have to somehow choose, okay, I have 50 requests, which of, what, or which of these am I going to send first to the browser? That is why HTTP 2 and 3 have something called a prioritization system, where the browser decides which resources are most important. So for this example, we have three preloads on top. Those are going to be important later on, but not yet. So maybe give those medium priority. Then we have three uh, render blocking CSS. So those are super critical to get started. So those are highest priority. Then we have four deferred JavaScripts, where the developer explicitly tells the browser, this JavaScript can perfectly load at the end of the page load. It's not that important. So the browser says, oh, that's fine. I'm going to give it low priority. In case you can't see it, it's low. And then all the way on the bottom, we have a parser blocking JavaScript. So it has to be there to start actually rendering the page. So that's going to get a high priority, right? So that's conceptually what should happen. The browser reads all of these things in HTML, requests them all at the same time from the server, and for each resource says, server, this is how important this resource is. And then the server is expected to do very simple. It's just going to say, okay, I'm first going to send the highest priority, then high, then medium, up until lowest. Right? That's conceptually what's supposed to happen. In practice, of course, that is not what always happens. A lot of the times, the servers do not listen to what the browser is telling them. So in this case, all the colors are different resources. And the browser is telling it, I want the top, the top uh, row. And some servers do this more or less OK. But others, like Node.js, for example, just ignore whatever the server, uh, whatever the browser is telling it, and instead just round robin the resources, just distribute the bandwidth across them as they wish. Now, when I saw this, I thought, well, if some of these servers are allowed to clown around, I'm also going to clown around, right? So I brought some props today. <laughs> right? This is cheaper than going to Turkey for a hair transplant. Uh, also looks better. Um, so what you're going to get, especially with the bottom one, right? This is actually quite bad for web performance. Why? Well, I have a good waterfall for that. <coughs> Here, some of the high-priority JavaScript on top and some of the high-priority fonts are actually being delayed. They're being load late. Why? Because we have a ton of low-priority images in the middle that the server is also giving some bandwidth to at the same time. So the critical stuff on the top is being loaded later than it should, just because the server is not listening to the priorities that the browser is telling it. You might think, oh, Robin, that's just you know a one-off, an edge case that doesn't happen a lot. Well, <laughs> I've been researching this for a couple of years now. And the latest tests are from earlier this year, where I looked at some of the biggest deployments in the world. You all know these, probably. And only two, only two, <laughs> of all of these, get this prioritization stuff 100% correct. That doesn't mean that everyone else is completely wrong, right? There are intermediates, but there are definitely some that just don't listen to the browser at all and get it completely wrong. And this is one of the main reasons why you still have this behavior in the browser, even on HTTP 2 and 3. It's kind of like protection against a buggy server. Imagine if you wouldn't have that and the browser would request all 50 resources at the same time, then the buggy server has like 50 different ways of messing up the send order. But if you only take, let's say, the 10 to 20 most important things first, then yes, the server is still going to mess up, sadly, but at least it's only going to mess up within these critical resources, and those are going to be loaded as soon as possible without interference from the lower priority, the less important things, right? That is why you will see this two-step loading. The browser is trying to protect against buggy servers. At least that's one of the main reasons. Now, you might think, Robin, <laughs> this is somewhat interesting. But why do we actually care about this? Again, this is black box stuff. The browser does this for us. I, I don't do anything with this. Well, the thing is that the browser isn't perfect. The browser makes mistakes. 
It might have some things on top, so in the first part of the page lo of the load, that you as a developer would actually like to be on the bottom, like delayed, or vice versa. Some things that the browser says, oh, I don't think this is important, but you know, oh, actually it is, right? So you want to kind of nudge between these two uh, areas <coughs> with things like fetch priority and preload. But to properly do that, we first need to understand what the logic actually is to get to these two steps. So that's where we're going to start. And the big, big problem with this is that this is incredibly badly documented. Okay? There is only this one weird Google Doc that you might have seen floating around on the internet. Describes more or less how this is done for Chrome. And that's it. There is no documentation for Safari, nothing for Firefox. Almost no blog posts or anyone who has ever looked into this in detail. So what I've done for the talk today is done my own research, trying out a bunch of page loads, trying to see what is actually happening behind the scenes. The high-level results look a bit like this, where Chrome and Safari are kind of doing the same thing, but with some very, very important differences. And then Firefox, of course, goes on and does its own completely different thing <laughs> that is kind of perpendicular to the other two. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with Chrome, understand what that does, and then we can escalate to the others after that. So for Chrome, what is it doing? Like I said, it's barely documented. In that Google Doc that you can find, there's basically these four lines. And that's all you get. That's all you get to describe what the logic is behind there. So let's try and read that. <coughs> so it says Chrome loads resources in two phases. That makes sense. The first phase is tight mode. So it's a top one there. And tight mode, as long as that's active, it constrains the loading of lower priority resources until the body is attached to the document. Until the body is attached to the document. That makes no sense at all. What does that even mean? Luckily, the text actually says it. What that means is, after all blocking scripts in the head have been executed. So tight mode, this first phase in Chrome, is going to run until all blocking JavaScript in the head is done executing. Keep that in mind, that's going to be very important. <coughs> in tight mode, you normally don't load lower priority resources, except, that's the bottom sentence, low priority resources can be loaded, but only if there are less than two in-flight requests at the time they are discovered. Again, that's a very dense sentence, right? Don't worry, we're going to see some examples later <laughs> that show <laughs> what that means. First of all, though, we need to explain what it means by lower priority resources, right? What is delayed? What is the bottom here? Lower priority resources. Let's look at how Chrome actually prioritizes stuff. So the HTML and the CSS, that is highest priority. That needs to come in, that's quite obvious. But then for JavaScript, we actually have quite a bit of variety there. JavaScript in the head, so partial blocking JavaScript, is high priority. JavaScript on the bottom, on the body, the bottom of the body, is still render block, it's still partial blocking, but it's going to be medium priority. And then async and defer JavaScript, where the developer is intentionally saying, look, this can be delayed, the execution of this can be delayed. Chrome is going to take that as a, as a sign that it should be low priority on the network as well, which is going to be the same as images. All images in the body are also going to be low priority. So what the, the text said is that during tight mode, lower priority resources are delayed. And what that means in practice is everything medium, low, and lowest. So during tight mode, it's only going to load highest and high priority resources, delay everything else. Let's look at a very concrete example. Very simple web page. It just has two partial blocking JavaScripts. It's two blocking JavaScripts in the head. And then 10 images in the body. That's it. You can very clearly see here tight mode in action. right? Because the HTML is loaded. All of the resources are discovered. But the images are not requested until those two JavaScripts are done downloading and executing, All right? Super simple example. This is what you would have gotten from Chrome about a year ago. 
if you do this exact experiment now, it actually looks a bit more like this. Where somehow we now do have five images in the body that are being loaded in type mode as well. So why is that? Because I didn't show you the whole document. <laughs> About a year ago, Chrome actually decided to do uh, a change to all of this logic. From then on, the first five images in the body, the first five are now, instead of low priority, are going to be medium priority in Chrome. The idea there being that the largest colorful paint image is probably going to be somewhere in those first five. So if you do this for every web page, the chances that we increase LCP or improve LCP for the web as a whole is going to be good. Right? That's the, the thinking. Now, of course, it's still just median. So it shouldn't be loaded in tight mode. And that's why they actually also changed tight mode a bit. So about a year ago, Chrome 117, it says in tight mode, Chrome will now also load two medium priority resources at a time as well. That's what it's saying. So now we can explain why this looks like this, right? So we do have tight mode with the JavaScript. The first five images are getting medium priority. And there can be two medium priority things downloading at tight mode at the same time. So you get the first two. Once those are downloaded, you get room for two more. So the next two, when those are done, there is only one medium priority thing available. You get that. And then you again wait until the JavaScript is done to get the rest. That's what Chrome is doing, right? Let's make it a bit more complicated. <laughs> Let's talk about that last sentence in the document, that weird sentence that we had, right? That says, there can be low priority resources in flight, uh, download in type mode, but only if there are less than two in-flight requests. So it's a similar page here again, but one of the JavaScripts now is going to be done loading much earlier. So what happens here about halfway, JavaScript is done, there is only one in-flight request that second JavaScript. Suddenly there is a room opening up for one low priority resource, which here is going to be the sixth image. Then you have the JavaScript and the sixth image. Those are two in-flight re re requests. The other images have to wait. First image completes. Ah, there is room again for one more. Next image, next, next, next. Right, that's kind of the logic of what that's doing. <coughs> now the next one is one that surprised even me, even though I know about this, but I was doing tests, and this one I, even I didn't see coming. And that is that this tight mode is really only the JavaScript in the head. Apparently not the CSS. So this is again a very similar page. We just have three CSS in the head and then 10 images. You can see these images are not being delayed. There is no tight mode because Chrome only does tight mode for JavaScript in the head, not for CSS. This was surprising to me. I talked about this with Barry this morning as well. It was even a surprise to him. Okay, and he works for Chrome, okay? So kind of weird. Now, I can keep going, but I think you kind of now have a feeling for what this does, right? So let's test that. Let's put you to the test. Let's take this simple page again. We have two blocking JavaScripts on top. Those are going to be high priority. Then we're going to have two deferred JavaScripts, also in the head, but they're going to be low priority because they're deferred. And then we're going to have those 10 images again. First five are median, and then five low. So what I want you to do now, I'm going to give you like 10 seconds. Just think about it for yourself. What do you think this waterfall is going to look like? Just think about it. Now, I get that this might be a bit difficult. In practice, you need a bit of a nose for these things. <laughs> you know. So let's look at what this actually does. <coughs> this is the waterfall for that page. So we get the two critical JavaScripts first, then we have our five medium priority images as we had before. And then, because our deferred JavaScript is low priority, it is actually also only requested once tight mode ends. Okay, together with those five low priority images. Now, for some of you, this might be obvious. For me, when I first learned about this, it was not, okay? Because my mental model was still, anything that's in the head is more important than anything that's in the body, 
right? Because it's in the head. Of course, that is not the case here, even because even the deferred JS in the head is being loaded after those first five images in the body, right? I'm not going to say if that's good or bad. That's just the way it works, at least in Chrome. So let's go to Safari, <laughs> okay? Now first of all, I would like to thank Barry Pollard for doing this photo shoot with me this morning. <laughs> you know, I, thi I think the pics came out very well, Barry. Uh, great stuff. So Safari, like I said, this is not documented anywhere, okay? I only had my own tests and whatever came out of that to try and decipher what's going on. So we're going to try to see what it's doing. We're going to, again, use the same uh, pages that I used for uh, Chrome, of course. So this is that one page, two critical JavaScripts, 10 images. Uh, Chrome, we already saw that, of course. This is what, ja what uh, Safari is doing with the same page. Two things stand out. One, Safari clearly has a tight mode. Okay, Very clearly, the images are being delayed until the JavaScript is in. So it is doing tight mode. Two, it does not have those five medium images at the top. It's only Chrome that is doing that special casing, at least for now, okay? Let's look at what happens with that weird uh, one low priority request at a time thing, right? So here again, if we stop loading uh, one of the JavaScripts early, you can see that Safari actually has exactly the same logic there as Chrome. It can have low priority stuff in flights during tight mode, but only if there is only one other thing going on. So far, very similar. That stops now. <laughs> I told you I found it weird, and even Barry found it weird, that CSS in the head does not contribute to type mode in Chrome. In Safari, it does. In Safari, CSS and JavaScript are pretty much the same when it comes to triggering type mode and, uh <coughs> and delaying resources. Personally, I think what Safari is doing is more logical but pending more discussion, of course. Now, this is all what is happening in the head, right? Chrome is very head-focused. What happens if we take those critical JavaScripts and put them in the body? So here, I just took those partial blocking JavaScripts, not in the head, but all the way on top of the body. You can see, again, Chrome clearly says, I don't care about whatever happens in the body, there's no JavaScript in the head. There is no tight mode, there is no tight mode. I'm going to request everything at the same time. Which is, again, the opposite of what Safari is doing. Safari doesn't just look at the head. It's just saying, OK, partial blocking JavaScript, that's going to have to block whatever comes after me. Right. Now, interestingly, it doesn't just delay everything until all JavaScript is done. Because if we move the JavaScript to the bottom of the body, it's all the way to the bottom, Safari actually does the same as Chrome. It does allow all the images to be requested at first without delaying them. Now, of course, I couldn't help myself. I also had to test what happens if you put the JavaScript in the middle. <laughs> five images, JavaScript, five images. And then you get weird stuff. Not so much on Chrome. Chrome, again, doesn't care about JavaScript in the body. It just requests everything at the same time. But Safari is doing weird stuff. Right. What I thought first was Safari is just going to delay everything after the partial blockers. That's not really the case. Here it only requests the first two images and still delays these other three until the JavaScript is done. If it would just do everything after, I would expect the first five images to start immediately and then the rest. So I don't quite know what Safari is doing. <laughs> It's very difficult to get the exact algorithm, but it's clear that they do have some different heuristics than Chrome going on here. Okay? With that, it's time to test your skills again. Try and imagine what this would look like now in Safari, right? It's the same page as we had before. Two uh, blocking JavaScripts, defer, and then 10 images. What would this look like in Safari? Just again, 10 seconds. So the answer here looks like this. So the two 
high priority stuffs are loaded first, but then the defer JavaScript, even though it's also not high priority uh, or it's not render blocking in uh, in uh, Safari, they are requested during tight mode while the images are still being delayed. Right now, in case you don't remember, let's compare that to what Chrome was doing. Right, Chrome delayed the defer JavaScript while Safari actually fetches it during tight mode as well. So the same HTML, simple HTML, completely different waterfalls. Okay, now I can't claim that I fully figured out what Safari is doing. Like I said, this is just from tests. But it looks like Safari and Chrome are somewhat similar in a lot of concepts, but a lot of important details are different, still leading to big, big uh, behavioral differences. Right? Now that we know that, let's look at the third one, which is Firefox. Right? Now I'm very sorry, I tried to get Barry for a, a photo shoot as well, but he refused to wear the furry Firefox costume. Uh, so I had to use AI, I'm sorry for that, but blame Barry. Now for Firefox, I can be very, very concise. It's very simple. It just doesn't seem to do tight mode at all. At least for HTTP 2 and 3. It does have some of that logic for HTTP 1, right? That it optimally uses HTTP 1 connections. For 2 and 3, doesn't seem to care. Whatever is in the HTML, let's just request it all at the same time. In a way, that makes Firefox the most pure of the browsers. It trusts in the goodness of the web. It trusts that all the servers will be well behaved, which is a noble thing. But in practice, with all these buggy servers around, Firefox might actually end up being a bit slower than Chrome and Safari because it doesn't try to do additional logic. And what you get from that is, again, for that exact same HTML that we've seen two eyes before, we get yet another very, very different waterfall, very different way of loading resources. Now, I have to say, I talked to the uh, Mozilla Firefox team about this. They confirmed that they don't have tight mode, but they also said they are currently reworking all of that logic in the browser as well, because they're adding fetch priority support, and that kind of forces them to think about things. <laughs> so it might be that this is actually going to change in the next couple of months to a year, but even then, I doubt that it will ever be exactly the same as what, of what the other browsers are doing, as we're st still going to keep these very different behaviors across browsers. And I don't know about you, but that just makes me really, really sad. Okay? Because I keep running into these issues where browsers just don't agree on what to do. And the only way that I can be happy after I've been sad is to look at clowns. Okay, so I brought another prop. If I could, I would have put on another another wig, but I, I don't have one, so I'm just gonna put on. Uh, there we go, feeling much better already. Okay, so now finally, finally, we know what the browsers are doing, a little bit of why they're doing it, and especially how they're doing it all differently. Finally, we can talk some useful sense, because now you will also see that it's, it's probably going to happen a lot that the browser gets it wrong, or maybe one of the three browsers gets it wrong, that it's loading something in the wrong phase that you want to move those around. And again, that's where you kind of have these higher level features that conceptually would help you with that, right? You have a ton of these, I'm going to talk about two. First, fetch priority, and then preload, right? So first, fetch priority. As you might know, you can indicate fetch priority high or low on most uh, image uh, resource loading things now, which is going to either slightly increase what the browser is doing. It's not going to set the priority to high. It's just going to do a little bit more than what it normally would do or a little bit less than what it normally would do. Right? You can see how this makes sense if you are in that bulky uh, uh, range of requests. You can kind of move requests around make sure that the server delivers them earlier than it normally would. That's the obvious use case. You can also use this, however, to kind of jump between the two phases of the tight mode logic, right? Especially in Chrome, because in Chrome, all of this is priority-based. So you 
can use fetch priority high if you have things on the bottom that you want to get to the top. That's uh, possible in Chrome for a couple of key use cases. Images are obvious, but then of course also defer or async. As we just said, Chrome actually delays them until after tight mode. If you do want them in tight mode, you can use fetch priority high for that um, as well. So an example for images. <coughs> Here on top you have Safari uh, without fetch priority high, right? It delays all the images. And then here I only have fetch priority high on the fifth image, which is my LCP image. And you can see that indeed it doesn't just change the priority, it also actually changes when the request gets uh, sent on the network on Safari, right? It actually changes what the tight mode or in, in which phase this image is getting loaded. And it also works in Chrome. It's a little bit more difficult to see because of the, the weirder logic. But so without fetch priority, fifth image is the last median one. With fetch priority, it's already high, so it's actually being requested as one of those first five resources as well. Right. So that's how you can bump things up. Conceptually, you can also bump things down. If the browser is being a bit too eager, you can actually force things in the bottom phase by doing fetch priority low. Right? This can especially be interesting for, let's say, the first five images. If Chrome gets that really wrong and your <laughs> LCP image is actually number nine, you can actually forcibly move them down. You have a lot of other use cases there as well. For Chrome, for Safari, I tried. I can't find a single uh, situation where using fetch priority low actually removes things from tight mode in Safari. What I was trying to do was trying to make Safari not load the first scripts that early on, right? Because Chrome, like we said, Chrome doesn't actually load defer in tight mode, it delays, so I was trying to replicate the same thing with uh, Safari. It doesn't actually work. It changes the priority on the network, it does that, but it doesn't actually move it to the second phase um, there as well. <coughs> The uh, Safari, uh, it it has it is high in Safari. The Safari deferred JavaScripts are high, not low, like in Chrome. Good question, but you didn't catch me in an error, Barry. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so the ironic thing is that Firefox is actually the browser that would benefit most from fetch priority. <laughs> because it doesn't do this tight mode thing. It has everything at the same time. So you can really benefit from having some things bumped up in that long list and some things bumped down. Ironically, it's of course the one browser that doesn't have this yet. Okay, but like I said, good news. They are working on this. I hope to see an implementation of this in the coming months, but not yet. So you can see the fetch priority is, can help you a little bit, but it's not really the full on dream scenario that fixes everything. Right? For that, we might need to look at another weapon to combat the uh, tight mode problem, I would say. Right? Now, this year, sadly, I could not bring my real sword like last year, but I did do my best to um, find a suitable alternative that uh, fits within the current theme of the day. Right? Now, what is this mystery additional weapon that we can use? That is, of course, preload, right? Especially if you might want to get things into that tight mode um, on top. Because what you might think is how preload works. You might think the preload is telling the browser, if you encounter this preload right here, you immediately have to request this resource the moment the parser encounters it, right? So ideally, if you had have the preload on top of the head, the browser would immediately request that image as it comes in touch with the preload. That's how you might think that it works. In fact, of course, it does not do that at all. Right? That's not what preload does. Uh, in fact, it's more like a hint that says, you know, browser, you, you're going to need this at some point, so please load it at your earliest convenience. Okay? Not right now, just when you have time. Um, you can very clearly see this in this example where we again have a simple page where I have six images preloaded on top. Then I have my typical uh, two parser blocking JavaScripts and then 10 more images there. 
You can clearly see this uh, in Safari. Those six preloads don't all fire at the same time. Only the first two. And the next four are still being delayed until after type mode. Now, this is not just Safari. Um, Chrome does the exact same thing. It's just a little bit more difficult to see because the DevTools won't allow me to uh, sort requests based on order in the HTML. Barry, feature request, please. Thank you. Um, but it's actually doing the exact same thing as uh, Safari on top there, right? What is this actually doing? Well, this is just default tight mode behavior, right? This is the one thing that says, oh, there can only be two low priority things in flight at the same time. Because preloading, some people don't know this, preloading by itself doesn't actually change the priority, at least for images, right? In Chrome, if you have image low, normally if you preload it, it stays low. It doesn't go up in <laughs> Safari, funnily, it actually becomes a lower priority if you preload the image. Doesn't really matter for our tight mode discussion now, but it's like, I think it's a bit, bit, bit of a weird behavior, right? But so preload just keeps it at low priority. The tight mode logic is mostly priority based. And so that's what you get here. These are just low priority things. I don't have to fire these immediately. I just push them into normal tight mode, even though they are preloads, right? The way you do get browsers to request that much more urgently is predictably <laughs> by using fetch priority on your preload, right? Because there you're literally saying, okay, I preload this and it's actually high priority. And then the browsers do switch to a higher thing. And you can see this very clearly in the waterfalls here. Here I have the same six images preloaded, but with fetch priority high on there. And there you do see they all get requested at the same time before the JavaScript, right? Now, at this point, the real question you should be asking yourself is, is this a good idea? Because I am preloading images um, before the JavaScript. You can definitely see this for Chrome. Preloaded images with fetch priority high are high priority. The same as JavaScript. So what you're basically saying is, server, you need to send me these six images before you send me the JavaScript. And I'm going to switch now to web page test uh, waterfalls because they make it much clearer when data actually comes in. So this is the same setup. One image on top, preloaded with fetch priority high. You can see it actually delays when the JavaScript is coming in because they're both high priority and the image is first. So the server is actually doing the right thing here. It's just the browser that's, well, it's not the browser that's messing up. It's just the pattern that you shouldn't be using. <laughs> because yes, your LCP image is now very early downloaded, but it's useless because you can't show it on the screen until all the JavaScript is done anyway. So you're delaying your JavaScript for a useless LCP image, at least at that time. So what you should actually be doing if you do preload uh, LCP with fetch priority high is put it at the bottom of the head, right? Below your partial blocking JavaScript so that it still gets requested early on. It's still high priority, but at least it's not preventing your JavaScript from being downloaded and parsed and executed first. Now, I don't know about you all, but the whole thing that depending on where you put this one preload statement can have this big of a difference is a pretty big foot gun me, right? This is not obvious at all. In fact, I'm bringing this up because I can't keep track of how many customers, how many client sites that I've seen where they just preload everything at the top of the head and they unintentionally delay everything that comes behind it because they don't understand this stuff. Let's make it worse. <laughs> the real question you should now be asking, now that you understand this, is do you even need that preload at all? Why am I preloading this image? To help you understand that, let's imagine, this is the last time I'm going to ask you to imagine things in your head. Imagine what would the waterfall for the page look like if you wouldn't have a preload, if you would just have the image tag in the body with fetch priority high. So no preload, image tag in the body with fetch priority high. What would the waterfall look like for this simple page? Just 
Again, 10 seconds. In many cases, it's going to be exactly the same. Right? There are some edge cases here. It depends on how many resources are between the head and, and the image and stuff. But generally, what's going to happen is the browser is going to discover the image tag with high priority. The image is going to be high priority. And so it's going to be requested in tight mode all the way at the top. And because it's below the JavaScript in the, in the uh, document, it's going to, of course, be loaded after it as well. So you basically get more or less exactly the same behavior if you do preload versus just using image with fetch priority. This is why I nowadays mostly say that you really, really should only be using preload very, very sparingly. You almost always are using it wrong. Okay, There are a few edge cases where it makes sense, definitely, but usually you should only be using preload for its original intended purpose, and that is for things that are not in the main HTML. So things that will actually be discovered late. Fonts are an excellent example of that, right? Still use preload for fonts. Or for example, if your LCP image is um, not in the HTML, but dynamically inserted with JavaScript, you shouldn't be doing that. But in some cases, you just can't fix that right away. Then you can still use um, preload for that. For most other cases, fetch priority is probably just the better solution. Now, I originally had a bit more on this um, <coughs> because you now have uh, single page apps that also are using preload to fetch JavaScript for uh, things that they need for next navigations, right? So all these files in Next.js are not needed for the current page, but they will be needed for the next routes. And so some JavaScript frameworks preload these, as you can see, with or without a fetch priority. Uh, this whole thing where this is kind of okay in Chrome, disastrous in Safari <laughs> in some cases. I didn't actually have time to keep it in. Uh, the same thing goes for a lot of other stuff, right? So I looked into a ton more things, how this interacts with early hints and uh, what font preloading actually does and that kind of stuff. If you're really interested in more of this, I can't imagine you would, but if, <laughs> please come to talk to me afterwards. And I also hope to do a couple of blog posts uh, detailing some more of this. Right, Because now we're almost 45 minutes in. You have been listening to a guy that has been progressively more and more clown-like. <laughs> so the question becomes, who is the real clown here? Me or all of you? <laughs> right. Now the main thing I would say is, is this the most important web performance talk you've ever seen? No. Not by a long shot, right? In many cases, the network is not going to be your lowest hanging fruit, right? You can more easily fix other stuff. However, if you're trying to squeeze that last bit of performance out of things, then you do run into these low level things and you do need to know a bit about how they work. And that is where the frustration starts because then you kind of figure out this, where even though this is a very simple page using the standardized web platform. Still, you get massive differences in what the browsers are doing with this. And then if you try to use standardized features like fetch priority and preload, they're also inconsistently implemented. Right? So it's almost impossible to make web pages that are consistently performant across all the major browsers. Virtually impossible. Okay. And the worst thing is, I can't even blame developers for not knowing that. Because most of us are very, very focused, probably just on Chrome and just on the core web vitals. And this is understandable, right? Google has done a most excellent job. Their tools are top notch. They have great documentation, right? I really like the fact that they're pushing these metrics, trying to improve performance. Uh, and it is true that the other browsers, the other companies, are severely lagging behind. Okay, I really think uh, Apple and Mozilla need to step up, up their game, better document what they're doing, what they're trying to do, and finally implement the Core Web Vitals, please. Okay, but that's something they have to do. I do also think that Google could do a bit more. They're already doing a lot, but I think they could do a bit more. For example, I'm a big fan of the web.dev 
website writes great, great content on there. But the moment you get to these very fine technical details, like what I discussed today, it's really more like chrome.dev, right? They only detail what the Chrome browser is doing, ignoring the internals of the others, right? Which is a bit counter to what they claim <laughs> on the web page there as well. So what I would like to see is web.dev becoming more of an open platform where others can contribute, that you can also see content for other browsers besides Chrome. Even though, to be very clear, this is already an excellent, excellent resource, right? So I'm perfectly willing to help start contributing to this more, and I hope some of you might as well be. With that, we've reached the end of the talk, and I'm going to leave you with an amazing clan-related joke that I found on the internet. And in case I don't see you after, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Thank you. Right, yeah. I don't know if you have time for questions, probably not. You know. If you have questions, come find me after. I would say. Or do we have time? Three minutes? One question. <laughs> oh boy. One question. You see some community try to push uh, pull requests into Nginx on Node.js to get a better standard implementation? It's possible. For, for Node.js, for example, it's just very difficult <laughs> to implement that in their, uh, in their setup. They're aware of this issue. It's just very difficult to do. And they don't have people with enough knowledge or motivation to, uh, to try and fix it, uh, I guess. So yeah, it's, it's perfectly possible they accept, but you need a lot of technical knowledge to be able to correctly implement this. Uh, especially in something like Node.js, which has like, it has C++ in the bottom and then it needs to interface with JavaScript and everything and it just becomes a mess. Uh, which is why Node.js also doesn't have HTTP3 yet, right? They've been working on that for four years <laughs> and it's still not in there just because it's very difficult. So yeah, if you want, volunteer, but I wish you good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, there's, there's one more. Quick one. Uh, thank you. Uh, what about the loading lazy and loading eager attributes on images? Yeah, so loading lazy is uh, completely bypasses the whole thing and actually just is a different thing. The, the browser will discover it, but just keep it away until it starts to be sure that it's supposed to be on screen, right? And then it's going to uh, request it immediately. Now, I didn't quite test what happens if you start scrolling during tight mode, <laughs> if it then also jumps, because Chrome does change the priority from low to high the moment you have like visible images. So there's, there's definitely a lot more nuance here <laughs> that comes into play that I didn't test. Uh, but in general, lazy loading images just bypasses the, the system a little bit. It's, it's like its own thing um, until the images are requested, and then they jump in there. Make sense? Right, I'm going to let you all go. Thank you all for coming.